This is the case of the people of the state of Colorado versus James Egan Holmes, case number 12 CR 1522. The records reflect that Mr. Holmes is present with his attorneys and the prosecutors are present as well. We are outside the presence of the jury. Before I bring the jury in, I have two things. One, I, I just want to confirm that with respect to any references to deceiving, and this is on pages 28, 67, and 77 of your PowerPoint presentation, Mr. Brockler, those all refer to um, activities that took place before the shooting. Is that correct? We're not talking about deceiving, for example, an expert witness. No, you're, 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 67 and 77. Okay, great. All right, and that was, I just wanted to make sure because I ruled based on that understanding, so I wanted to make sure that was accurate. Uh, before I bring the jury in, I want to address the spectators in the courtroom. Uh, this is a public trial, and I want everyone to feel welcome and comfortable here. That's important to me. However, you must observe proper courtroom decorum. I am sensitive to the fact that this case may evoke powerful emotions. I fully understand that. For that reason, I have not prohibited emotional reactions. To the contrary, in Order D-79, I recognize that some visible emotional reactions are inevitable and appropriate. What I have prohibited are audible comments and emotional outbursts that may improperly influence the jury. If at any time you feel the onset of an emotional outburst, please quietly and discreetly exit the courtroom. You may return to the courtroom when you're ready to do so in compliance with my order. In general, so far in this trial, there have been no issues with anyone in the gallery. I thank you for that and I ask that you please continue to conduct yourselves as you've done throughout the trial. Please remember that it is my duty and responsibility to ensure that both parties receive a fair trial and to uphold the dignity of the court. All right, with that advisement, let's bring the jury in, please. Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury is back in the courtroom. Good afternoon, folks. I hope you had a good lunch. I apologize for the delay. Uh, as I have mentioned before, delays are unavoidable. Uh, there are times when issues come up and I have to take my time with them. I can't rush things. Please don't hold it against either side. Uh, if you need to hold it against someone, because that will make you feel better, hold it against me. <laughs> uh, but don't hold it against either party, okay? All right, with that, we're ready for the next step in the proceedings, which is closing arguments. And as I indicated to you, the prosecution goes first. Mr. Brockler. Three years ago, next Monday morning. Your Honor, I'm sorry. I'm looking at a TV that doesn't have anything up on it. Can we uh, get me fired up? Yes. May I blame the court for that as well? You may blame. 
you may not blame me, you may blame my staff for that one. <laughs> Just trying to spread it a little bit. <laughs> Three years from next Monday morning, three years ago, 400 people from this community filed into this theater. They came in happy. They came in hopeful of being entertained. They came in, some alone, some with loved ones, some with parents, and some with children. They came in hoping to see a story of a hero dressed in black. Someone who would fight insurmountable odds in the name of justice and trying to protect others and for peace. But that's not what happened. Instead, a different figure appeared by the screen dressed all in black. And he came there with one thing in his heart and in his mind, and that was mass murder. He came in with overwhelming firepower. He brought with him over 700 rounds, including steel penetrating rounds. And he shot anything and everything he could. On July 20th, 2012, in this kill box 13 miles from where we sit right now this guy walked into that theater and tried to murder everyone in it but he was successful in and I use this term delicately only killing 12 now as we've gone through this case this guy created so many victims. Admittedly, there was a sense of rote or routine about it. Some victims, even beyond the deceased we see here and we struggle to try to remember over the last two and a half months, some of them don't ring a bell and we'd have to go to our notes because he made more than 12 deceased. He made 70 other victims. Some names you'll recall, some names you won't. Some sat up here for all of 10 minutes and it felt like all they were allowed to tell us was they went into that theater to watch a movie with someone, they smelled tear gas, something horrible happened, and they were injured. But this part of the case makes them more important now. There's no way I can go through all of these victims with you, just like I told you in opening, but your notes and your memories hopefully will help guide you to what they told you. Seventy people were injured in that theater. You heard from 69. The only one you didn't hear from was Ethan Roars, because he's three. Instead, you heard from the people that were with him. One of the people that you didn't hear from was Matt McQuinn. You may remember that Matt was 27 and he went to the theater with his roommate and the woman he loved and had hoped to marry. No other victim was shot as many times as Matt McQuinn. Eight times. And you'll recall from that horrible image in your mind that he was near the bottom of the theater seating. Legs contorted underneath him in an unnatural way. He did that. And like all the victims he created here, he did it for one purpose, to make himself feel better and to increase his theoretical sense of value, not to anyone else, to himself. Now look, this is the portion of the case where we have to talk about the law. My goodness, the judge read to you some jillion instructions, lots of pages. And I want to go through some of that with you now. And you'll get them, obviously, to take back and look at. This one is the first one I think that we should focus on. It talks about reasonable doubt. And it tells us reasonable doubt isn't some vague or speculative, guessing, imaginary doubt. It's a doubt that's based on common sense. That means you get to use your common sense in evaluating every piece of evidence in this case. And that includes evidence from people that have been called experts by the court. 
There are charges here, and you've heard them, and they overlap, and we'll talk a little bit about them, and I'll try to make some sense of them. Murder in the first degree. There's two kinds, remember? There's after deliberation, and there's extreme indifference. These same 12 people that that guy murdered applies to both of these charges. Now, the elements of these things, and the way every charge works is, it's somewhat like a recipe or a math formula. If you're missing one of the elements, you can't get to the right answer. So it's our burden to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt every single thing with a number by it up there. Not because I say so, but because the judge says so. Now, some of this stuff isn't really hotly contested here. That the defendant, there has been no evidence that anyone else on the planet Earth walked into that theater dressed in bulletproof garb, armed to the teeth, trying to kill everyone in the theater. Just him. In the state of Colorado, out or about the date and place charged. No one says this took place any place else or at some other time. The other part of this is that he caused the death of someone not himself. There's really been no evidence at all that anyone other than this guy seated right here killed all those people. So what's, what we will discuss are the things in the middle, after deliberation, with intent, and thankfully the court gives us some instructions on that. And you're going to have to forgive me here. I thought I could do this without this. Oh, man. The term after deliberation is defined for us in a pretty good way. It is a decision after the exercise of reflection and judgment. And you know what? It's never hasty. The opposite of hasty. You've thought about it. A person acts with intent or intentionally when their conscious objective is to cause the specific re result they were trying for. It really doesn't matter if the result occurred. And that's helpful to us in the attempted murder charges. And we'll talk about that. Now, how is that different than extreme indifference murder? Well, we still have that, the defendant, in the state of Colorado, and he caused the death of another person, not himself. But in the middle, we have some different elements. Now he has to act knowingly, and knowingly is defined only as with respect to the conduct he's engaged in. He's aware that his conduct is of such a nature that it could result in what? Right here, with respect to a result that is practically certain to cause that result. Here's some key language for extreme indifference. He has to act with attitude of universal malice, manifesting an extreme indifference to the value of human life generally. This isn't just risky behavior. This is behavior that is obviously going to lead to potentially the death of another person. He also has to engage in that conduct that created a grave risk of death. So here's how we might analyze that charge regarding these people. This is just an example of working through this instruction. We know he wants to kill people. He knows that there are people in the theater. He creates a, pill, a kill box through all of his planning and his efforts. He goes there with 700 rounds. He surprises the people he wants to kill. He traps the people he wants to kill. And he fires steel penetrator rounds at the people that he wants to kill, at people. And he causes their death. He's aware when he shoots those steel penetrator rounds throughout that theater that it's practically certain to, the result, to result in the death of people. He's also, in doing that, isn't he evidencing an attitude of universal malice, an extreme indifference to the value of human life? And when you work through the checks that way, that leaves us with one thing at the bottom that we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, and that's that he wasn't insane when he did it. So can someone be guilty, and this was a question asked, of both extreme indifference and after deliberation murder? Absolutely they can, just like here. So for instance, when he goes into that theater, we know that he intends to kill everybody he can in that theater. That's his intention. He's deliberated on it, and now he's carrying out the plan. But the way he goes about it in the theater, specifically the steel penetrator rounds, the way he shoots at people sometimes to try to get them to, to stop fleeing, going through the walls, going through seats, he does so in such an extreme manner, it shows this universal malice and this grave risk of death to others. He didn't go in and line people up and shoot at them face to face, one on one. This is both. Now the attempted murder, again, there's attempted murder for after deliberation. All 70 of these victims apply. There's all the same elements with this one exception. They didn't cause the death of the person. Instead, they had to take a substantial step 
towards it. Same thing with extreme indifference. Same elements as extreme indifference, but you didn't cause the death, you took a substantial step. So what's a substantial step? You probably didn't need the law for this. It's conduct strongly corroborative of that person's purpose in the commission of that offense. That's what attempt is. And if you didn't have that instruction, you'd use your common sense and it would be just like that. So, here's that last piece. He said, I'm not responsible for what happened because I was insane. And so now we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he was sane. Here's what the defense of insanity says. First, he's got to be insane at the commission of the act. Not four months later, not February of 2015, not today. Got to be back on July 19th and 20th of 2012. So one of the things that uh, is an issue here is, is he so diseased or defective in mind at the time that he's incapable of distinguishing right from wrong? And that's defined for you too. Incapable means, just like we've talked about for months now, measured by societal standards of morality. It doesn't refer to, however, a purely personal and subjective standard of morality. The law doesn't care what he thinks is right or wrong. It cares if he knows what society thinks is right or wrong. Here's the other part of that. He could have a mental disease or defect that prevents him from forming the intent to act, to deliberate, or even to act knowingly. That's another component of insanity. But there's a cautionary tale here. Do not confuse mental disease or defect with moral obliquity. The idea that someone just simply rejects society's norms and standards. Mental depravity, passion growing out of anger, revenge, hatred, or other motives, those things don't get you to insanity because when an act is induced by these causes, the person is accountable to the law. So what is a mental disease or defect? Only those severely abnormal mental conditions that grossly and demonstrably impair a person's perception or understanding of reality. Now, to some extent, it seems like it's been taken for granted that if someone has a diagnosis of anything that we've talked about, like it's been talked about for this guy, that that automatically makes it a mental disease or defect under the law. And you can see that's not true. In fact, if you conclude that the evidence has shown that he's mentally ill, has a mental diagnosis, but it hasn't grossly and demonstrably impaired his perception or appreciation of, real of reality, then that's it. We're done. There is no more insanity. Here's the other thing that we know. It's not enough to have that. See, here's what Colorado could have done. Colorado could have had a law that says, if you have a mental disease or defect that grossly impairs your ability to understand reality, that's it. Game over didn't do that. Instead, they said, you need more. You need to have it be such that it affects your capacity to know right from wrong and your capacity to form the intent to act. So here's what we know is not insanity just by virtue of it existing. Mental disease or defect. A million different diagnoses that in our own life experiences are serious but not enough on their own to be insanity. Bipolar, depression, ADHD, Asperger syndrome, antisocial personality disorder, delusion, psychosis, schizotypal personality disorder, schizoaffective disorder, even schizophrenia. In and of themselves, they're not enough under the law. You have to have something more. And who says that? How about every single mental health witness that we've had in this case has said that? That that's not enough. Just because you're schizophrenic or ADHD or schizotypal, that doesn't mean you're insane. DSM-5 says the same thing. Remember that when we had a couple different people read it up here, there's a cautionary instruction in there. Do not use this book to simply try to figure out sanity. It takes something more. It takes something forensic. Your common sense tells you that too. From your own life experience, the people that you know, that you've encountered, maybe even people in your own family, that simply having a mental disease or defect or a diagnosis doesn't make them insane under this law. Our law says that that's not enough. So it's not enough to know what the diagnosis is. 
We've spent a lot of time trying to drill down on what's the diagnosis, what's the diagnosis, and what the law tells you is, doesn't matter. The diagnosis is irrelevant. It's how it affects the person. Here's some other stuff that isn't relevant to the law, but for, but for someone's mental illness or their desire to want to do something. You don't see that in any instruction that's been given to you. That's not part of the law. It's not about November of 2012. It's not about the things that we spent about a week to a week and a half going over four unmedicated months after that guy was locked up and was facing numerous murder charges and potentially the death penalty. What happened in November of 2012 cannot instruct us on what he was capable of in July of 2012. You know who said that? All those mental health providers that came in and talked about it. It's not about an MRI taken only months ago. Now the questions can and were asked about what could it have told us if it were taken earlier. Here's what we know. No matter when it was taken, it's simply not good enough. The technology isn't good enough to make it diagnostic. More than that, we don't know what it would have looked like in July of 2012 to not diagnose something. And one of your questions revealed something even more telling. And that is, we don't even know what impact the antipsychotic medication the defendant has been mandated to take for the past couple years has on that MRI. So discussions of this MRI cannot help us know what, what, what his brain was like in July of 2012. What will tell us is behavior. We can also look at changes. And what you know from every single person that has come up here and testified from CU, his girlfriend, his friends, Drs. Fenton, Drs. Feinstein, anybody that saw him over that year plus period before he committed this horrible act, they've all said the same thing. Guy was exactly the same at the end as he was at the beginning. Who says so? Everybody. You cannot find someone that says he was different. So we look to function, and that's what the mental health experts say. Not diagnosis, it's function. <coughs> Capacity. Did that mental disease or defect demonstrably impair him, even before we get to right or wrong? So let's start talking about some of the stuff that we know from the evidence. He knows his plans are against society's standards of morality because of deception. Look at the things that he does with his parents, how he communicates with them. Three days after the G-chat, where he talks with Gargi Dada about human capital, these are the emails he exchanges with his parents about a Roth IRA. Not much stuff going on in April 1st. Been working with stem cells. School's boring. Seems like a degree factory. Mother's Day, he calls his mother, shares nothing of this with her, in fact, when he calls her, it's three days after he purchases the tear gas, the gas mask, and the handgun. And he says nothing. And he gives no indication of anything wrong. One of the victims that you may recall was Rebecca Wingo. And she was a mother. Mother of two daughters. A single mom. 32 years old, she went to the theater that day with a man named Marcus Weaver, who you heard from. She went there for a nice night out, not having to care for the kids. She, like almost all the other deceased, was shot in the head and in her torso. On May 21st, after Mother's Day, he's emailing his mom, finished the quarter, choosing a thesis lab. By June 9th, he'd purchased a handgun, a shotgun, an assault rifle, and here's the communications with mom and dad. Not much news here. We talk about the weather. And then on June 11th, after it's become official that he's not going to be in school anymore, he tells his parents, I'd prefer not moving back with you, if only as a last resort to homelessness. June 12th, after he owns all those things, he gives two alternate emails. They have no indication from him of anything. By June 16th, he's purchased a 100-round drum, magazines for his weapons. On June 16th, after that, he's emailing his mom about applying for unemployment. And you know what? He did apply for unemployment. Nothing else new 
going on. By June 20th, he purchases targets, laser sights for his weapons, bullet, blocker, jacket, and here are the conversations with mom and dad. She emailed him in Spanish, he emails her back in Spanish with the cutesy sign off, hasta la vista baby. To his dad, he says they denied the claim for unemployment insurance. Again, no indication of his true motives. June 27th, no fires or smoke. Not much else going on on the 4th of July. And seven days before he unleashes havoc in that theater, his parents reach out and say, we'd like to come out in August. How about the 10th or 12th? And his response is, I don't have any plans for that weekend. Now that's not deception of law enforcement, that's deception of his mom and dad, also part of society. But there's more. How about his girlfriend and his friend? He tells Dr. Woodcock that he attempts to recruit them subtly, lightly, when he has that G-chat with Gargi. And I want to take a moment to remind you of this. There will be pictures of the notebook up here. There will be quotes that you will see are attributed to statements that the defendant made to mental health professionals. And you have to remember that those things can only be considered by you for sanity issues. Nothing else, not any other part of the charges, just the issue of sanity. He says he's going to test the waters. But now you know what he knows? They reject his philosophy. These members of society push back. Uh, Gargi tells him it may satisfy you, but it doesn't help fulfill your purpose. And he says, well, it still makes my life more meaningful. And she says, I don't see how it's useful. And she comes back hard on whatever he thinks or tells us is going to be his delusion. You're not getting anything incorporated into you. It's not as if by killing someone, you're making yourself stronger. You're just taking away a life, and that seems like destruction. He goes out of that and knows that his girlfriend, the only woman he's ever loved, rejects that idea. Another indication society doesn't agree. Gargi shows it to Ben. Ben is his really his longest and only friend at grad school, other than Gargi. Remember when Ben Garcia gets up here and testifies, amongst other things, he says, you know what, the defendant has seemed to be angry at the world a lot of the time. And he was a very deliberate guy. Well, he and Gargi take that chat, and they go and talk to him about it. Now he knows his friend has read it too, and his friend rejects it too. They ask him to share it with his therapist. And he says, I am. But you know what? He's not. He doesn't. He won't. He knows now that these other people have heard his philosophy and they disagree with him. That relationship ends shortly after he has revealed to them what he's thinking. How about Miss Allen? Does he come clean with her? No. It's July 8th. It's now 11 days before he'll create this bomb inside his apartment. She asks, are you back in California already? And he says, still have a couple months on the Colorado apartment lease, knowing full well he's never going to fulfill that lease. How about Drs. Fenton and Feinstein? Never tells them, denies a plan, denies the target. Why does he keep seeing them? Why does he keep seeing them? It's the same reason he didn't drop out of school. And here's what he told Dr. Reed. I thought it would look conspicuous if I just dropped out without any warning or any justifiable cause. So I dropped out with the reason that I failed prelims. The questions asked by Dr. Reed, well, what if you just dropped out? It probably would have raised red flags to my professors and to Fenton. That's why he continues to go see her. No false sense of rapport and no information gets exchanged. He is killing time. How about to the CU Neuroscience Program? He acquires the cell phone stun gun and folding knife prior to May 10th. I can't tell you when, but what I can tell you is we know every single purchase that he made from May 10th forward. You've seen them, the ones that he didn't make with cash. But here he has a cell phone stun gun and a folding knife while he's still at school. He attempts an online purchase of a handgun on May 10th. He purchases that gas mask, he purchases the tear gas, and let's stop for a minute to ask the question, why does he need tear gas as he's thinking May 10th of 2012? Well, we know that he considered doing serial murder on hiking trails in, the, in federal forests. Doesn't need tear gas for that. He also considered a biological attack. He doesn't need tear gas for that. Why the tear gas? Because by May 10th, 2012, he already knew what he was gonna do. And that was go to that theater and try to murder 400 people. 
He attends all of his classes despite these, these steps in preparation. He attends all of his labs. He turns in all of his assignments on time. He does well on the written assignments. He gives presentations, including that one there, to Freed's class. We saw that video that was taken by Yom up here. And you can watch it again. It's three little segments that add up to a minute or 20 seconds. He's still giving presentations and doing okay. He decides not to drop out of school. He goes through the prelims, as we know, because of deception, because he doesn't want to raise red flags. He goes and sees Dr. Fenton and Feinstein on the 11th. Again, never tells him how much he's purchased already in weapons. He tells him he's going to look for a job. That's not true. He, uh, no student loan debt. He tells him he has $10,000 in the bank. He has his parents' support. He tells him he has a lease until November 1st, and he has no intention of breaking that. Objection to misuse of the defendant's statements. This is not relevant to sanity. Would counsel please approach? The objection is overruled, but Mr. Brockler, you uh, may proceed as we discussed at the bench. Yes, Your Honor, thank right, you. Go ahead. And I want to be clear about this. You know that slide I put up there where we talked about the statements made to mental health professionals and that they can only be used for sanity? This one right here is demonstrative of that guy's understanding, even back then, that what he was going to do was wrong based on societal standards of morality. And that's why he attempts to deceive her about his true plan. He rebuffs all offers at continued free treatment because that's not his goal. His goal is to get out of there. And he's gone in, I failed the prelims, I'm ready to go. He's completely unprepared for them to say, that's okay, you don't have insurance, we'll take care of it. That's not the answer he wants. So what does he do? He gets up and leaves. How about his neighbors? He closes the blinds at his apartment as he begins to plan this massacre. And the numerous air fresheners that he places in his house, why does he do that? because he doesn't want them to know or anyone to know about the gasoline and the other chemicals inside of his apartment before he's ready to surprise them. How about the purchases? He bought some online. He says he told Dr. Reed he tried to buy it online because it was cheaper and like any good compulsion you can still be a bargain shopper when you're compelled by some mental illness. He bought some at stores based on location. No hasty purchases, not a one. He says he bought firearms and related qu equipment over time in order to avoid suspicion. And he needs to avoid suspicion because he knows that anyone, including the stores, that see him purchasing in a certain way would object or ask questions or even question whether or not what he's doing is societally appropriate. Patience. Patience is paramount with this guy. He knows society believes it is evil and it is wrong what he's doing. How about these G-chats? What's important about these is this is him unplugged. This is him unfiltered, right? 
There's no impression management here. He is talking to the one woman who he has fallen in love with in his life, the one woman with whom he's had any intimate experience physically. So he's willing to be open with her to see what she'll say. And he tells her, what I feel like doing is evil. So I can't do that. She asks, what's so evil? And he says, kill people, of course. She says, killing people is too much effort. You'll get locked up. And he says, that's why you kill many people. She asks, why don't you kill me and Ben and others? And selfishly, he says, well, I would be caught. And I wouldn't be able to kill anymore. I'd also lose the rest of my life. And he says, I'm not inherently evil, because he knows what evil is. I found a purpose for good, because he knows what good is as well. He says, there's no way to do it and not get caught. And that's why you wait till the end of your life, so you don't have anything to lose. He knows what society thinks about what his conduct is going to be. There's no reference there to anything that Dr. Gurr came up with in her interviews. Where's that reference to put others out of their misery? An inevitable catastrophe. Not believing he was substantively harming anyone. He knows that life has value. He talks about it. He tells Gargi, what is more valuable than life? Taking a life will prevent that person from having any of life's experiences. A.J. Boyk. 18 was prevented from having any more of those experiences. This is that picture that was taken inside this theater in seats just like these behind them. He'd found, he'd found a woman that he loved and she was turning his life around. They loved the movies, they loved Batman. She went out to buy the Batman paraphernalia that day and like so many others, never made it out of his seat as he came in with those steel penetrator rounds and shot him dead. This guy knows that life has meaning before he does this because he says, listen to Gargi, if there's meaning to life and you take that away from other people, you've prevented their purpose. Jessica Gawi, 24, she was prevented from her purpose. Wanted to be a sportscaster, aspiring, young, full of life. She, too, murdered in the seat she sat in. Alexander Teves, 24, had just completed his master's degree in psychology. He was with his girlfriend, the woman he would have married, but for the fact that he was shot through the head in these seats by him over there. He says, my outlook on destroying life. He knows what he's doing. He knows his plans are cruel to his victims. This is out of that notebook that we get to consider for insanity. The cruel twists of fate are unkind to the misfortunate. That's what he writes before he heads out the door to murder. And he's sort of right here. You remember Michaela Medic? 23. Michaela had come to the theater with a group of friends and they'd gotten stuck in these seats up here. Do you remember that? And she and a friend looked back and they saw two seats and they thought, our lucky day. And they got up and left their friends and sat there. And the bullets hit her and not the friend with her. And she died right there where she sat. He knows that his victims won't agree with him. He knows his victims want to live. He knows his victims are going to resist his attempts to kill them. They're going to try to save their own lives. So he leaves nothing to chance. He's planned for all the contingencies. And all of that planning goes to the intent. His conscious objective is to cause that specific harm, to take away that value, to take away that meaning, to destroy life. So once he chooses Century 16 Theater, he's got a series of steps to go through. And this guy thinks, way down the road. That superior intellect, it shows no signs of waning as he leads up to those theater doors. Look at what he does. He's got to find the right theater inside that complex, the most controllable, with limited exits. He's got to limit the victim's ability to escape him. Again, intent. So he goes to case the place. Out of this notebook we can consider for insanity. Objection. The Misuse of the defendant's statements. Overruled. Isolated, proximal, large. That's why he picks it. 
And here's a big one, inconspicuous, because he knows society will reject what he wants to do. You know, over that course of that two months, he sees nine different movies in that theater to find the perfect one for the killing fields he wants to create. And he does it with cash. And we know that because you don't find any purchases on any of the credit cards. And what that, and not Fandango either. And what that means is he had to personally go in, interact with the ticket taker, and pay them money nine times to get this information. That's the theater he cases. There's his drawing, pretty accurate. Here's what he's looking at, reduced visibility from behind. Here's more visibility, unoccupied buildings that block the view if you go to the back of the, of the building. He begins to go through the, and you saw these and you can see them again. Look at the words he uses. Don't like this one, too many exits. Here's a good one, only two exits. This is a smaller, air, smaller area size, only two exits. Again, very positive. Two visible, four exits. Avoid this one. Starting point more conspicuous than others, because he knows that if people see him, they will resist his attempts to kill them. Objection, misuse of the defendant's statements. It's nothing to do with sanity. Overruled. You can't lock the double doors on a couple of these things. And look at the word he uses there, many escapees. He knows what he's doing is objectionable to his victims, and he doesn't want them to get away. Least conspicuous is a theater. You can lock the double doors, inflicting mass casualties. I might even be able to re-enter and kill more, or, if the compulsion lets me, bail. Real smokers could be an early warning sign. We don't like that. He's also got to find a place, maybe he can limit the exits if there's too many. And there's the double doors he can lock with the handcuffs he talked to Dr. Metzner about. There's these double doors in the theater and you could lock them by having the handcuffs connected to each handle. I'm sorry, Dr. Reed. And he buys them. June 6th, the day before the prelims, he already knows what he's going to do. The prelims are irrelevant. And there's one pair of them that were still there at the scene. He decides to start at theater number nine. He researches other mass shootings like Columbine. Now he tells Dr. Metzner that, and he tells Dr. Metzner it's to figure out police response times and how much ammo is needed, but maybe there's something else. Maybe it's the opportunity to figure, how can I be the biggest, the best? And he does. He figures that the Aurora Police Department is three minutes away. And he even has the National Guard up there because this thing's going to be so big, maybe they'd get involved too. Remember, he has the capacity to form the intent to act. This is his conscious objective, is to cause the specific result, the death of other people. He knows his victims want to live. The question that's asked by Dr. Reed is, and the question is, would they mind being shot? What do you think you would have said on July 19th? And he says that they'd probably mind being shot. He knows the victims don't agree with him. And by the way, those victims also part of the societal equation. He wants to anticipate the victims' efforts to despite the fact that he's gone to the trouble of limiting their exits. So here's our theater. It's right here, and you can see. Limit exits available to the victims. We know there's the one that's going to be behind him, right? So he's blocked that one off. We also know that there are the two entrances from the side that form around the back. And so how does he block those off? The only other exit is unaccounted for is the uphill one. And he leaves that Judge, one. Judge, I object to the red crosses on the exhibit. The court's ruling. Sustained. You can see from here, here are the exits he needs to limit. He wants to control the crowds that will try to save their own lives. Again, it's his intent to cause their deaths. He's going to trap them. And how is he going to do it? How is he going to account for these two side exits? Two tear gas canisters. Two clear out gas canisters. But you know what? At the time he's purchasing that, he thinks, well, I've got to protect the most important person. I've got to protect me. So he gets a gas mask that he researches online same day. And there it is. Step number three, he needs to anticipate how they'll try to save their lives once they realize they're trapped. They're going to try to escape anyway. So he gets a scope and he gets a laser, and he's prepared to target individuals as they try to flee. He's going to shoot at the ones that try to escape to make sure that others don't follow. 
That's what he told Dr. Metzner. That shows you his intent is to cause their death. And here's that theater number nine with all that FBI voodoo with the lines. And here's the ones where he is shooting specifically at the exits. And look at where those rounds are going. They're not going high. They're going right where someone would walk. And if you're looking for evidence of extreme indifference, those steel penetrator rounds, they go right through theater, theater number eight. And we know that one of them hits someone all the way across the theater. There's those rounds going through. That's that universal malice. That's that extreme indifference to the value of human life. And that's the grave risk of death that he creates. And yet Mora, he was one of the ones that was injured trying to flee with his family, including Rita and Proteo, all shot by this guy trying to save their own lives. This is before the foot was amputated. He knows his victims want to live. He knows that the victims don't agree with him. So step four, he's got to anticipate how those trapped will try to save their own lives if they don't try to flee. They might fight. That's how he looks proudly in this picture. And when he describes the importance of that outfit to Dr. Reed, he says, well, I think someone would see someone dangerous. Objection. And Misuse the defendant's statements. This has nothing to do with sanity. Overruled. And members of the jury, I remind you that the statements the defendant made to Dr. Reed were admitted for a limited purpose and may only be considered by you for that limited purpose, and that is uh, to consider the issues raised by the defense uh, or by the not guilty by reason of insanity plea. Does everyone understand that? And everyone saying yes and not in their head yes. The objection is overruled. Proceed. Thank you. The other part of that quote was, you don't want 400 people rushing you. And the reason it's relevant to sanity, the reason it's relevant to his intent to act and deliberate, is why does he think they would rush him? Because he knows those members of society would disagree with what he was going to do. They're not going to view it as a favor. They're not going to view it as being put out of their misery. So they might rush him, and he needs to look ominous. He knows his victims want to live. He knows they don't want to die. They'll resist. How might they react? Well, running down the rows is impossible. It's impossible, especially with people laying there from having been shot. So victims will hide. They'll hide behind seats just like this one. His intent is to cause their death. And here's proof. He doesn't buy normal rounds for an AR-15. Already a powerful assault weapon. He buys steel penetrator rounds nine trips to the theater and he knows if someone tries to get behind something to save their lives that's what I think I need and you can see he's right those rounds go all the way through and in picking those rounds and in the way that he targeted these people he's also evidencing universal malice and extreme indifference to the value of human life and of course when he uses those rounds in this kill box it creates a grave risk of death Someone that found that out was Josh Nolan. You may remember Mr. Nolan. Uh, he ducked down with a friend and the friend's wife, and he tried, they both tried to cover her behind the seats. But Josh got shot a couple times. In fact, he still walks with a cane. It was the cane he used to demonstrate how this guy was patrolling around the front of the theater, seemingly looking for more victims. Do you remember the tattoo? It's not the same anymore, because they had to move it over to his arm which was braced down behind the seats when he shot through it with one of those rounds. So he's also got to anticipate things like the screams of his victims because he knows they don't want to be shot, they don't want to be killed, they don't want to be hurt. So he gets wireless headphones and he pumps it up all the way. That's what he tells Dr. Metzner. And there's the headphone sticking out of that gas mask. Now, once these people are contained, what can he do in advance to get himself an extra chance of killing them? How about weapons and practice? He's got to pick the right weapons for this kill. It's not going to be a bow and arrow. It's not going to be a BB gun. This shows you what his intent is. He tells Dr. Reed, I decided on the 40 cal because it has more stopping power. Objection. Than misuse of the statements, Judge. This has to, nothing to do with sanity. Overruled. And members of the jury, you'll remember the instruction that I gave you a moment ago that applies still. Mr. Bruckler, you may proceed. Yes, thank you. And, and I want to reiterate that too. There's nothing that's going to be up here over, ne over a mental health professional's name that you should be using for anything other than sanity. And part of sanity is trying to figure out if that guy could form the intent to murder after deliberation and act knowingly. 
and this says he could. He picks a 40 cal because it's got more stopping power. And then William Reed asked him, well, when you bought it, what were you thinking? What was your fantasy? And he said, just a mass murder situation. That tells you he's forming the intent. He's formed it. He got familiar with the guns by getting ready. He trains with them. He also gets a 12-gauge shotgun on May 28th. That's it right there. It's up here. And he tells Dr. Metzner, I picked that one because it was optimal in a theater for killing people. That shows you he has the intent, the conscious objective to kill people. He gets a laser sight to be more accurate. Targets on June 18th, a rifle scope, and then he goes out and trains. Byers Canyon, we heard about, or the Byers shooting range. It's two and a half hours away, and that's important because it's unsupervised, and he doesn't want anyone to see what he's doing because he knows society would reject his plans. He goes out there five times, two and a half hours away. He practices not on the little accuracy targets, the round targets. He practices on life-size silhouettes. That tells you what he's going to think he's shooting at here. He moves side to side. He's got to be able to move with his gun. He fires standing up. He tries crouching down. He needs to have all contingencies covered. He even practices inserting the magazines and reloading that. At the gun range, he puts his gloves on, the gloves he knows he'll use at the theater. I'd just go and practice in each designated area, and I'd keep shooting until I ran out of ammunition. But there's a problem, and this guy can solve problems. Problem is, Officer Donald Ransom pulls him over on July 2nd. Do you remember that? Going to buyers. And here's what happens. Donald Ransom comes up, and he looks in the back clear window of the defendant's car, and he sees weapons cases. And so he asks the defendant about him. And the defendant, without really making eye contact, tells him he's going to go shooting. But he's learned the lesson there. People can see through my windows. What's he going to do about that so that they can't see through the windows? Because he knows society would reject his plans. He goes online. He looks up window tinting. The fine for it in Colorado. He looks up the laws regarding window tinting. And then he goes to O'Reilly Auto Parts about nine days later buys window film, an easy install kit, and puts it on his car, problem solved. He also now, on step eight, has to bring enough ammunition to kill everyone, because that's his conscious goal. And he brought 700 rounds of ammo. That's his conscious objective, to kill all those people. Now he's got to plan that last piece of this to escape. And I know that there's been some suggestion, oh, he never planned to escape. He just went outside, and that was it. We know that's not accurate. First, the apartment diversion. Yes, it would allow him to kill more people, but it would also allow him to get away. He tapes up the gas mask, and we know that it doesn't affect his ability to see. He does a pretty good job of shooting people. It doesn't affect his ability to aim. He hits a lot of people, like Dion Rossborough. Do you remember Dion? Sat up here, nice man. He's got that drop foot problem now because of him. And he says, I am crouched down. I think I'm going to die. I'm scared. And I look up, and who's coming towards me? And he demonstrated that for us, just like Josh Nolan did. He is. He looks right at him and pulls the trigger. He's also disguised by armor, head to toe. He goes online. He looks for tire puncturing devices. Why? If getting away isn't part of the calculus, why would you ever look for that? And more than that, why would you buy it? way back on June the 6th, before you even started buying body armor. The day before the prelims, these in his car, in case I had to get away. Why would he have to get away? Because he knows what he's doing is illegal and society would reject it. He has $280 cash in his pocket. This is, by the way, at the same time that he tells one of the mental health providers, uh, I sent that burnt money to Dr. Fenton because I didn't need it anymore. What's this? He's got a first aid dressing that he purchases on June 6th also. And he tells Dr. Reed, that's if I got shot. He anticipates that someone, likely law enforcement, will want to shoot and kill him for the horror he's about to visit on these people. But here's the thing. If he expects to be killed, if he really expects to be captured, why does he need a first aid dressing? They'll either have him dead on the street or they'll be there to patch him up. Why does he think he'd need a first aid dressing unless it's in case he got away? There's no meaningless decisions for this guy. There's no meaningless purchases. Nothing is left to chance for him.
That's that first aid dressing. Remember the four things we talked about before in opening <coughs> statement? His main weapon for killing jams. And so now he walks outside from that theater to the unexpected. In his mind, when he goes out that door, there should be no one but victims at best. Everybody should be at his apartment building in flames. But you know what? They're not there. And when he walks outside, he tells Dr. Metzner he has the presence of mind to also problem solve. He does an assessment. There are two police. There's a police car with lights on it. He's got to be hearing the millions of sirens that are coming to the theater. And for the first time, he's got to know the apartment thing didn't work. My diversion failed. The police had already arrived. He felt outnumbered. He assessed that it was difficult to drive away in his body armor. He put his gun on the roof and he waits for them to come get him. That is logical, that is rational, and that is anything anything but psychotic. Police officers come towards him and he puts his hands up in the air to surrender because you know what he's concerned about after what he's done in the theater? Him getting shot. Because I was surrendering. He doesn't want to get shot or hurt. It's all about him. Let's talk about that apartment and the presence of mind and his ability to know, intent, deliberate, all of that. There are two issues that the apartment presents for us, really. One is it's part of the mass murder because it's the diversion that will allow him to make more victims and potentially get away. But more than that, and this goes to the intent, conscious objective, it's, at, it's got its own count. Count 141, possession or control of explosive or incendiary device. Here's that instruction. There's those elements that we have to prove. No one thinks it was anyone other than the defendant in his apartment in the state of Colorado. And they describe knowingly for us, with respect to conduct, that he is aware that his conduct is of such a nature that, it would, that he can possess those items. Explosive or incendiary device. Now, I've got to be honest, this is a long instruction. There are a lot of words in there, but here are the ones most applicable to what this guy set up in his apartment. An incendiary bomb, a fire bomb, an explosive bomb. Now, before the mass murder, he goes online and he looks up how to make bombs. Now, I get it. Dr. Woodcock thinks that anybody that's taken college chemistry knows how to build explosives. That's not true. Despite getting an A in it, this guy goes online to make himself smarter. He's able to learn new tasks. But here's the deception part of the apartment. He plans for contingencies. See that in the notebook, which we can consider for his ability to form the intent to act. He says the wild card in all this is explosives. I'm going to go simple and least suspicious because suspicion tells you he thinks what he's going to do is societally objectionable. He goes with gasoline and oil. He acquires a remote detonation system. On July 14th, only six days before the mass murder, he goes to the science company. Remember that guy, by the way, saying, hey, this is kind of like nerd heaven here. And there was nothing uh, unusual about that guy when he came in to buy those things. He tests at his house the only thing he can safely test. And by the way, if you don't think it's going to work, why test anything? He tests the quick fuse in the bathtub. Do you remember the glycerin that he buys from the science company and the potassium permanganate? Had you ever heard those terms before this trial? He's got it rigged up in a way where he's got that thin wire over the left part of that opening to his apartment and it's going to pull that thermos, spill that potassium permanganate, I mean the glycerin, into the pan of it. What's the pan sitting on? A carpet soaked in gasoline and oil. And if that glycerin touches that pan, kablooey, fire everywhere, right? It's a hypergolic reaction. I, you'd have to look it up. I don't know. Hypergolic reaction, fire. Um, there's a quick fuse that goes to each of these jars, these jars that contain thermite on the top. He didn't buy thermite. <laughs> this guy learned how to make thermite. And in learning how to make thermite, he had to learn how to make rust. He made rust to make thermite to help make his apartment blow up. You remember Garrett Gumbiner, special agent? He says, and the thermite uh, in the inaudible, in the shell? And he says, yeah, so like it would burn down, down the fumes, and then into that jar. That smokeless powder, he tells him, that's napalm. Did he go buy napalm at the science store? Judge, nope. I'm, I'm objecting to the doctoring of the exhibits with the, with the red arrows. Sustain. No objection. Sustain. 
Your Honor, may we approach real quick? Yes.
scheme. This is your copy. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. It's off. The objection is sustained, uh, and then Mr. Brockler may proceed as we talked about at the bench. Whenever you're ready, take your time. Okay, thank you. All right, turn your mic on, please. Okay, there we go. All right, you may proceed, Mr. Brockler. One of the things that's found in the defendant's um, apartment with all those other explosives that he sort of created, including the napalm that he made out of all that styrofoam he bought at Safeway, was a magnesium river, ribbon, which specifically talks about how reactive it is with water. But why magnesium? And you may remember this hypothetical question given to Dr. Gurr. Why magnesium? This goes to reflection and judgment because he anticipates, he deliberates that firemen will come and try to put out this fire. And so he wants to keep the fire from being put out by water, so he creates something on the floor that would keep that fire going. I got the green soda bottles because you can't see the gasoline in them. That's what he tells Garrett Gumbiner. Why would he want to deceive people about what's in those bottles? because he knows it's danger that it presents and he doesn't want to know about that danger. He saturates the carpet with gasoline and motor oil, a bunch of aroma things so that people, including his neighbors, w won't smell the gas. In fact, he says, so you don't smell the gas to Garrett Gumbiner. Boy, that's thoughtful. Boy, that's deliberative. He says, the computer makes the initial noise. I set that for 25 minutes of silence and then the noise. And then the boom box was 40 minutes. And then he goes into this lengthy discussion about how they're going to go outside and check on that remote control car that he'd set up out there. And people will fidget around with the remote and help set it off if the neighbor doesn't. The second guessing neighbor was one of the other things that kept this from being an even bigger massacre. After the mass murder, right there on the ground, Behind the theater, this guy has the presence of mind to answer this question. Do you have any weapons? Four guns, he says. No bombs here, but improvised explosive devices at my place. There's the improvised or incendiary device, firebomb. And he tells without any prompting, he tells Officer Blue, they won't go off unless you set them off. He knows. And he knows what he possesses, and that is explosives and incendiary devices. His deception continues with the theater goers. He can't just walk through the lobby dressed to kill, so he dresses like everybody else. He purchases tickets just like everybody else. He's not going to sneak in. That might draw suspicion or barge in. That might get people wondering. He's not hasty. He's very patient. He wants everyone at the theater to see him as no different than they are, as no threat. So he parks in the rear of the theater by theater number nine. He puts on his ballistic chaps because you can't drive with them on, and that becomes an issue later when he does the assessment about not fleeing. These are the ballistic chaps. And then he puts pants on over those, because otherwise they draw suspicion from society. He walks around to the front of the theater, and that's no short walk, but it's worth it, because he's got his plan in mind. He enters with all his potential victims, and he's got to know that, doesn't he? He dresses inconspicuously, just like them, on the right side of that picture. He acts like they do. He uses his ticket like they do. He waits in the concession area near theater number nine, right there, just like they do. And it has to dawn on him that some of these people could be in those chairs he puts those steel penetrating rounds through. He can see what they might see. And that is people, men, women, 
and even children walking through the concession area. Just like everyone else, knowing he is surrounded by those he will shortly try to murder as they sit in their seats. There's no haste about him. It is all patience. He poses no threat. He gives no indication of what is to come. He picks a seat near the exit he needs to access, and he waits patiently for all his future victims to get packed into their seats. He waits for the movie to begin. No haste. He picks his moment, and then he uses that cell phone ruse with that cell phone stun gun, right? Pretends to take a call. No one would expect anything else, and he heads outside. It's inconspicuous. He goes to the exit and secretly applies that special uh, picnic table clasp that he's manufactured to block the door from locking. Then he goes into his car and he puts up the sunshade to keep people from seeing what he's doing. He puts on his kill suit. He makes one last call to that general CU number. Why? And the mental health professionals that actually talked to him about it told you it's because he knows what he's doing is wrong and he's ambivalent. Someone answers, he says nothing, he hangs up. He gets his weapons and his ammo. He moves back to theater number nine. Do you remember the four things? Here's another one, the fumbled tear gas. And he fumbles it right behind that theater. That's gonna be for this exit right here, isn't it? He fumbles it, looks for it for a moment, then decides he's moving forward. He opens the door and he steps into the darkness. It was Alex Sullivan's 27th birthday that morning, July 20th, 2012. And you'll remember he was a man larger than life and a large man with a large heart. He stood up. He was the one that multiple witnesses said screamed, yeah, when the trailer for Superman was there. But the thing that brought down Alex Sullivan as he was there with nine other members of Red Robin where he worked was that shot to the heart that went through his heart and his lungs. And he died right there. Jonathan Blunk was only 26. He was there with a loved one, and you'll remember that Jonathan tried to cover her up to protect her, and protect her he did at the cost of his own life because the bullet that went through his head came in from the back and went out into the front, and he died right there. In fact, you'll remember that uh, the woman that was, he was with had to testify that she couldn't get him off of her. She had to crawl away and run away. Now this case, even though we have already shown all of the intent, all of the knowing, all of the extreme indifference, it's got mental health witnesses because he said he was insane when he did it. There's defendants' mental health witnesses here, and one of the things the judge told you about is you get to consider any relationship a witness may have to either side in judging their credibility. That's true for experts, too. Here are the three. Dr. Jonathan Woodcock, Dr. Robert Hanlon, and Dr. Raquel Gurr, in the order they testified, and they all have four things in common. They were handpicked by the defense. Not a single one of them is forensically certified. They have all testified exclusively for defendants in criminal cases. And each one of them, as you recall, changed the way they normally conduct themselves to suit the limitations placed on them by defense attorneys. Objection, Your Honor. Overruled. Let's talk about Dr. Woodcock. Dr. Woodcock board certified in forensic psychiatry? Never. Court appointed? The court trust him enough to appoint him? No. He worked for the prosecution? Never. He has worked exclusively for criminal defendants, including the same defense attorney here that used him before. He says he was qualified as an expert hundreds of times, but you'll remember when we actually discussed what it means to be qualified, it actually turns out to be tens of times. It was the only curriculum vitae not admitted into evidence by a psychiatrist or psychologist, and that's got to say something. He goes and sees this guy four days after he tries to murder that theater full of people. Four days! What a great opportunity. He sees him when he's unmedicated. But here's the problem. He allowed the defense to change the way he would do business Objection. to influence the evaluation. Same ruling. Overruled, based on my previous ruling. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Remember the defense investigator got to be present in the interview and even offered at least one answer to the defendant. Even Dr. Woodcock said that could be a problem, and the others agreed. Nobody else had a defense investigator with them for their interviews. 
He's not allowed to discuss the planning of the mass murder, murder the booby trapping of his apartment, can't discuss the crime at all. He's never told by the, about the notebook, so he doesn't know to ask about it. He doesn't return the jail psychiatrist's repeated calls about medicating this guy if he's that sick because the defense attorney told him not to call him back. So he acquiesced. He only spends two hours and 45 minutes and he gets some statements from the defendant. The defendant says he drops out of school because he felt like he was asked to quit. He said I was able to do the work, but I got bored. I didn't like it. He knows, he has the presence of mind four days after this to remember the precise thousandth of his GPA from undergrad. He also remembers that he went to the gym a lot there. He told him that people tend to show what's in their best interest to show in describing his parents. He told, that, he told Dr. Woodcock that he decided he wouldn't build a false sense of rapport with Drs. Fenton and Feinstein. He also says he didn't consider any of the homicidal ideation stuff a problem. He decided to quit school and his career as a neuroscientist. He tells him he stops taking his meds in May of 2012. Incredible presence of mind for an unmedicated guy four days after this mass murder. He tells him online dating doesn't work. And that actually Objection, turns out... Misuse of the defendant's statements. Um, Mr. Bruckler? Do you want me to? Yes, why don't you come up here? The objection is overruled. Uh, members of the jury, I remind you that any statements the defendant made to um, an expert uh, mental health uh, individual were admitted for a limited purpose, and you can only consider them for that limited purpose, and that is for the issues raised by the not guilty by reason of insanity plea. Do you understand that? Yes. Everyone saying yes and not in their head yes. Mr. Brockler, you may proceed. Really? Okay, thank you. Uh, let me explain this quickly then. Um, the reason this matters is you'll recall that Dr. Gurr, who based in large part her opinion of the defendant's sanity on this diagnosis of schizophrenia, said that one of the key features of that was withdrawal from society. And she had said that the defendant had withdrawn from society. Here, four days after the mass murder, he's confirming for this mental health professional, an expert hired by them, that he was making ongoing efforts to remain socially active, but they were failing. Online dating doesn't work. He tells them that he had these plans that he was thinking about. One was find a fix for whatever he perceived his issues to be. Plan B was the biological weapons issue, and plan C was what he did, which was the mass murder. In knowing what he was doing was wrong, he describes those, the bad ones, wouldn't be good for others. Again, four unmedicated days after he did it. He even says, I wouldn't want it to happen to me. He knows it's wrong. Wrong for him, wrong for society. He also knows right and wrong as he describes that prosecutors seek justice for those wronged, like in this case. He told him he decided not to take the antipsychotic drugs offered by Drs. Fenton and Feinstein because what future would I have if they took away that plan C, this mass murder thing that he wanted to accomplish? That goes to his intent to obtain and achieve that specific goal. He says he tried to recruit his friends in grad school. He says, I hate everybody. And isn't that a recurring theme through much of his writings before he gets to jail? In the notebook, in the G-chats, hate, hate. Oh, woe is me, I'll release havoc. 
He tells the doctor that he's canatonic. Another thing that later we're told is a key feature in some schizophrenics, except he's catatonic except for riding his bike to school every day, attending laboratory time, turning in all of his assignments on time, strong grades on his written work. He keeps shopping. He keeps paying his rent and bills on time. In fact, you'll remember, we had the lady from uh, the apartment complex who said she saw him right there in June, at the end of June, with the red hair. And he seemed just like he always did as he politely handed over the check. He worked out regularly at 24-hour fitness. And remember, Dr. Woodcock confirmed that, yep, he was really trying to fit his catatonia in over lunch. He denied having any thoughts of control. He denied being suicidal. Dr. Woodcock observed no mania. The guy denied any voices. The only thing he talked about with any potential hallucination, and it's the first time we hear this, are flashes to the side in undergrad, not the third lab rotation. Why did he dye his hair? He says, I don't know where that came from. There's no mention of an other guy. There's no mention of two selves. There's no mention of not me having done it. There's no mention of a master power that had influenced him or controlled him. No mention of a call for action or a mission. And remember, that word mission shows up nowhere before Dr. Gurr. No reference to the world coming to an end. No inevitable catastrophe. He doesn't write a report, handwritten notes only. And then, just months ago, two years and four months exactly, during jury selection, 18 days before you got picked, He's had no contact with any mental health professional. He has watched only 30 minutes of Dr. Reed's 23 hours. He called it sampling. He generated a 13-page report. He details the wrong legal standard, you'll recall. Objection citing that misstates the evidence. All right, members of the jury, you have to rely on your own memory of the evidence. The attorneys are allowed to argue based on what they remember the evidence to be, but ultimately, you have to decide what the evidence is. Does everyone understand that? All right, go ahead, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Citing irresistible impulse, which isn't the law here. And Objection, not Your Honor. That's not what his sworn testimony was. All right, again, same instruction, members of the jury. You have to rely on your own memory of the evidence. The attorneys may differ in their recollections. What's important is what you remember and what you determine the evidence to be. Again, do you understand that? Yes, yes. and everyone's saying yes and nodding their head yes. Mr. Ruckler, go ahead. He spent less time interviewing the defendant than answering defense counsel's questions on what he did in the case, in his opinion. Here's the kicker. Five days after he opines that this guy is insane. During jury selection, five days after he generated his report, he goes and visits him in the jail for an entire hour. No discussion of planning of the mass murder, no discussion of booby trapping the apartment, no discussion of the crime. That is Dr. Woodcock. Dr. Robert Hanlon, he is a board certified forensic psycho. No, never. Never been board certified in forensics. Never been court appointed. Never worked for the prosecution against a defendant. He initially said, I, uh, with Mr. King, I've testified almost exclusively for criminal defendants, but you'll recall under cross-examination, we were able to get rid of that misleading word. It's exclusively for criminal defendants including this same defense attorney, Ms. Brady. He did not interview the parents of the defendant, even though he wanted to, even though he thought it was important to do so. It was his normal practice to do so. He'd asked the defense attorneys for it, and remember the word he used? And he regretted it. He capitulated and didn't do what he would normally do. But here's the other thing with him. He can't tell us anything about this guy before April of 2013 when he does his first testing. He can't tell us anything about his mental illness before April of 2013. He can't tell us anything about his capacity to know right from wrong either before or after 2013. He can't tell us anything about his capacity to intend or deliberate or act knowingly, none of it, before or after 2013. Dr. Gurr. Dr. Gurr is an accomplished academic and researcher. And what she does matters, no doubt. But what she does is not in this courtroom. And she is ill-suited to do this function. Is she board certified in forensic psychiatry? No. 
In fact, what she told us up here was she's not board certified in her career field ever. She's never been court appointed. She's never worked for the prosecution. She's worked exclusively for criminal defendants. <coughs> she did not interview his parents before opining that that guy was insane and schizophrenic. Even though she wanted to, thought it was important to do so, it's her normal practice, it's in her published recommendations in her books. And she said because their calendars didn't match up for almost two years on the most important case in their lives. Two months before the selection, she finally sits down with the parents. And why? Preparation for trial? She doesn't video record the evaluation, even though she's testified previously she's delighted when it's recorded. She commonly video records her interviews in her practice, and she video recorded the last criminal defendant that she worked for the last time she testified. She discussed it with the defense attorneys, but then never pursued it. She spent only 13 and a half hours with the defendant before she declared him insane and schizophrenic, only 12 pages of notes before rendering a 14-page opinion in June of 2013. The majority of those 28 hours that she talked about, those came after doctors Metzner and Reed. The majority of her notes came after doctors Metzner and Reed. And remember those quotes that she had in her report? She said, yep, I agree with you. You can take them to the bank. When they're in quotes, they're his words, the way he said them. And then we got here. This was one of numerous examples of things that just didn't match. Getting killed was an option. Being captured was another. She said that's what he told her. That has a very different 50-50 could go either way meaning than what happened in her notes. I asked if he thought he might get killed. That was an option. I asked if he thought what will happen. And he said, I will be captured. That's different. And that's not indifferent, the way that first quote says. And you remember her defense to that? As to with many other things that were inaccurate? Well, it's the essence. It's the gist. It was the essence of it. Well, you know what? That might work in academia. That might work in the clinical setting. But in here, with lives at stake and lives lost, what we need from here is not essence. We need facts. And we need the details that are always important. Do you remember the thing that she testifies about and she puts in her report? She says, right at the end of the session, I asked him if he sees things no one else sees. And he looked behind me at the wall and he pointed and said, right there, a huge moment for any psychiatrist. That is a hallucination taking place in front of her. And do you know where it's documented? Nowhere. Nowhere. It just shows up in her June 2013 report. She also attributes to him statements and thoughts that nobody else says. Thought he would wound some, but didn't know he'd kill. That he was possibly being controlled by a master power. That taking action would lead others to do the same. And then there's that word mission that shows up in her notes in a question she asks him. And then it shows up everywhere thereafter. She also says that he indicates the world is coming to an end, that there's inevitable catastrophe, but here, last week, that gets watered down quite a bit. And that inevitable catastrophe, which are her words apparently, now becomes something more akin to the call for action. She is probably great at research, probably great at academia, but this requires a different skill set. A call for action a phrase that has only been used with her ever. Do you remember Dr. Metzner asks him about it two months after she writes her report? And two months later he says, he says, oh, I never said that. Dr. Reed, in 23 hours you never heard the phrase a call for action. But do you know when he brings it up again? With her again in November? Right before trial? She details the wrong legal standard and says she's considering irresistible impulse. Objection. That misstates her testimony. Again, folks, same instruction I gave you. You have to rely on your own memory of the evidence, including the testimony. That's what matters. The attorneys are allowed to make arguments, and 
as part of the arguments, they may remember testimony and other evidence in a particular way. You're not bound by what the attorneys re remember or by the attorney's arguments. Um, you determine what the evidence is. All right, Mr. Rockley, you may proceed. Thank you. And finally, she indicates that he thought when he was going into that theater to murder all those people that he was putting them out of their misery. And then on redirect, Mr. King asked her if he ever told her that, and she said, well, no. And then on recross, I asked her, didn't you put that in your report in quotes? And then she said, well, yeah. Gordon Cowden, you'll remember Gordon Cowden was a father. 51 years old, he'd had the summer off, and he was at the movies with his daughters when he was shot in the head and killed, amongst other places. There were also court-appointed mental health witnesses. Dr. Jeffrey Metzner, Dr. William Reed, they too have four things in common. They were also hand-picked by the Colorado Mental Health Institute at Pueblo and appointed by this court. They're both forensically trained and forensically certified, and they did not change their practice to suit anyone on any issue. Let's talk about Dr. Jeff Metzner. Board certified in forensic psychiatry, sanity evals, he at best estimates 100 to 200 times has he done this. He's been court appointed 80% of the time. That's how much the court values his opinion. He's worked for the defense and prosecution. He said that other 20% pretty equally divided. He reviewed every single thing in this case. The only thing he told you he glanced at cursorily were the medical records of some of the victims, same as Dr. Reed. He called everyone. Again, no one else had done this. He's calling every mental health provider. He's calling parents. He even calls doctors Woodcock, Hanlon, and Gurr to get their input. He spends hundreds of hours before he conducts his forensic interview. That's obviously 23 hours of not video recording because that was Dr. Reed. 23 hours he spent uh, interviewing him. He generated a 120 page report, including an addendum he described, where he went line by line through that notebook. It was detailed. He found corroboration for all the things that they discussed. He did a detailed analysis that you got to hear about up here and he rendered a clear opinion. An opinion that he said, I am highly confident that the defendant had the capacity to know right from wrong on July 19th and 20th, 2012. That the defendant had the capacity to intend, to deliberate, and to act knowingly on those same dates. He is sane. And he was on the 19th and 20th of July. How about Dr. Reed? I'm sorry, ma'am? Th thank you, ma'am. William Reed, also board certified in forensic um, uh, psychiatry. He's done dozens of sanity evaluations. He's been court appointed two times, including in this case. But here's the kicker. Much like the witnesses hired by the defense, he's testified almost exclusively for criminal defendants too. Remember that? He's testified for the prosecution only one time. And you know this about a guy who does sanity evaluations and testifies 13, 14 times for the defense. He's not testifying that their clients are sane. This guy knows sanity and he knows insanity. He also reviewed all the reports, all the records. He called everyone, including doctors Woodcock, Hanlon, Gurr, hundreds of, there it is, now it's accurate, 23 hours of video recording that he did, and you sat through all of it. It wasn't the essence of what was told to him. It wasn't the misquoted phrase. It was his words, the way he delivered them to the questions that were asked, including follow-up. He came back afterwards to chase down answers to other questions. Not every victim in this case, as you know, is deceased. There was Caleb Medley, age 23. Caleb was that aspiring stand-up comic who was there with his pregnant wife. 
and in one of the most compelling parts of this case early on, you'll remember as he sat there with blood pouring out of his face, his wife takes a cup of water as the first responders are saying, you got to go, you got to go. And she's like nine months pregnant. She pours that water over his face and she kisses him and she says, I'll take care of our baby because she thinks that's the end for him. Miracle of miracles, it's not. She's in one place delivering their son. He's in another place having his brain put back together. And he's seated out there right now. Judge objection. This is calling on the passions of the jury. All the rules. Farah Sudani was 22. She was part of that Red Robin crew, the big one there to celebrate Alex's 27th birthday. Do you remember that? Now, this is the injury we can show, and it's the least of them. Because what you'll remember about Miss Sudani is that she was completely eviscerated by the defendant's bullets. Her organs spilled out of her and had to be held together in her as they whisked her away. These two are victims of the defendant. William Reed generates, despite the 23 hours of recording, a 58-plus page report. It is detailed. There is corroboration. There's a detailed analysis, and there's a clear opinion, and he too, highly confident, the defendant had the capacity to know right from wrong back in July. He had the capacity to intend, to deliberate, and act knowingly. He too, the second court-appointed psychiatrist, forensic psychiatrist, says that guy was sane when he went into that theater to murder all those people. All of this evidence allows you to check these boxes, and the last bit, the defendant was not insane beyond a reasonable doubt. And as you work your way through these charges, keep in mind, it is unlikely that he could be guilty of attempting to kill one and not another, but go through that process. Sane. Sane. John Larimer. He was one of the people killed when the defendant was sane. 27 years old. You'll remember that he had friends. Bear was one of them, big guy. Came down here and wept as he tried to describe how he and his friend would not leave John behind. They tried to drag him down the stairs. They couldn't do it because he came back. So they hid behind the seats and ultimately they had to abandon their friend. John was only hit a couple times, but the bullets ripped through almost all of his internal organs, killing him pretty quickly. Jesse Childress, 29 years old, Air Force guy. You remember that he bought the tickets for his friends that he went there. He likely died early from the shotgun blasts, the pellets ripping through him. The defendant, before the notebook, before he mails it off, before he heads out, to do what he's going to do, changes his dating headline on two websites, Match.com, Adult Friend Finder, and he lets us know what he thinks society will think about his conduct. Will you visit me in prison? And you knew it ended this way. Ashley Mosier. Ashley Mosier walked into that theater on the 20th of July, a pregnant mother of a six-year-old and in moments, moments, she left there, carried out, a miscarried mom with a dead six-year-old daughter. Four bullets pumped into her by that same guy right there. The courage that she showed to come here and tell you that was remarkable. And then Veronica Mosier Sullivan. Forever our kindergartner. Hello, 911, where's your emergency? Uh, I can't hear you. picture is her, the sound is him. When you
and you're done with this case, I want you to go back there. Go through the instructions. Deliberate the way that you've sworn to deliberate. Look at the evidence and hold this man accountable. Reject this claim that he didn't know right from wrong when he murdered those people and tried to kill the others. Reject this claim that he couldn't form the intent to murder, to deliberate on murder, and to act knowingly when he set up his apartment full of explosives. That guy was sane beyond a reasonable doubt. And he needs to be held accountable for what he did. Thank you. Members of the jury, uh, let's go ahead and take our first um, afternoon break. Um, it's about 3.05. Let's plan on taking about 15 minutes, if it's okay. Please make sure you follow my admonishments during the break. They continue to apply, all right? I'll see you back here in about 15 minutes. Thank you. Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury has exited the courtroom. Is there anything we need to uh, talk about before the break, Mr. Brockler, on behalf of the people? Sure, may I confirm the amount of time that I have left? I, we have down that I have uh, 23 minutes and 30 seconds plus the extra hour the court prom I mean the extra two minutes the court promised. So 25:30. Does that sound right? Wait, the extra two minutes that I... For, for the... I, Your Honor, Mr. Orman thought that you had set up at the bench that there you could give me two minutes to help fix these uh, slides and whatnot. Oh, I did, but I don't think I said that I would give you extra time. I did say I would give you um, whatever time you needed. But if that's what you meant, uh, now I understand what, what the request was about. Ms. Robinson, what do you show him having left? So she shows you having 23 minutes. Uh, Mr. King, do you have any objection to an additional two minutes? Yes, Judge, I do. All right. I'll give you an additional two minutes. There were several interruptions, uh, so I think it's fair. So you'll have 25 minutes for rebuttal. Is there anything else we need to talk about on behalf of the people at this time? No, sir. Any, anything else on behalf of the defense at this time? No, Judge. All right. Have a good break. I'll see you back here in about 15 minutes. Thank you. The court will be in recess.